Hey, it's Chris Schmidt, episode 33 of the Average Joe Sports Show, and Matt Rule, an update on Husker Matt Drills. Mitch Sherman here. We're talking Husker hoops and throwbacks to the 1980s. Hi, it's Bill Dolman, and the Husker baseball team is off to a great start near the top of the nation. And it's Elijah Herbal here. We'll hit a topic everyone's been asking for. We know, we've heard an inside look at the Husker Vision operations at Pinnacle Bank Arena. Welcome to it. It's the Average Joe Sports Show, episode 33. That's Mitch Sherman. We believe water is in that uh, cup. Bill Dolman, Elijah. I haven't Herbal. resorted to the hard stuff yet. Yeah, we're, we're 30 <laughs> seconds in. Chris Schmidt, hope you're doing well. And we invite you to check out the Average Joe Sports Show on iTunes and Spotify. Download the podcast, tell a buddy, and uh, also check us out on YouTube, the AJ Sports Show, the AJ Sports Pod. Follow that on Twitter. Well, still a, a couple of weeks till uh, Selection Sunday, or a little less than two weeks, but Nebraska polishing off a perfect home March at PBA, perfect home Big Ten record. We'll start with hoops, guys. We'll get into some Nebraska baseball, some Matt Rule uh, tidbits, some sound bites from Rule as well. But, guys, we've all seen Nebraska basketball for a lot of years. Elijah, you remember the No Sit Sunday era? Billy D, you called some of the tournament teams. And, Mitch, I know you covered Nebraska during the knee era. I was in Section B hoping my brother wouldn't spill soda on Steve Taylor and get a nasty look. (laughs) And uh, you know what? This year has been a lot of fun, and this team's really come together, Mitch. The knee era, the Collier era, the Sadler era. Let's see. We can can go on. I was Timmy uh, Miles. Yeah, for sure. Timmy Miles didn't cover him as much, but, you know, he's got the the only tournament run of the past 20-plus years, so – a feather in his cap for sure. I was. I have my fur coat over here that I was going to wear to the, to the show tonight, um, in honor of of uh, Josiah Alec and his his post game attire on uh, Sunday night. That was pretty epic. But you know, I think this is kind of like a fur coat, kind of kind of into the home season for Nebraska. I mean, if 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 you're ever going to wear a fur coat in in front of the cameras, that was the time to do it. After you go 18 and one at home. And ten and zero in conference play. What what just an, an epic home season at PBA for Nebraska this season, and they are desperately hoping. I, I don't I don't think it's possible, but they're desperately hoping not to return to PBA as a top seed in the NIT. No kidding. <laughs> And how about Josiah you know, Alec? It, the, the personality he's brought to the Husker basketball team. There's so many great personalities with Kese, what he does on the floor. But Josiah, like, I remember the picture of him. Uh, from this past December, I think he was sitting on Santa's lap on a picture that went out on Twitter. You have him in the fur coat. I mean, the, the Alec family has become an institution in Nebraska over the past 12 months or so. They've been fantastic. But Josiah, what a great personality he is. From a, a media standpoint, being able to cover him, he is just fantastic. Always great for a social media picture. Always great for a quote. I mean, the four-wheelers and the flamethrowers Flame comment he made earlier this season – he has just been a godsend for Husker Media, the personality he's brought to that team. On, on a team full of, uh, I shouldn't say full of big personalities, but a team that's got a few big personalities in their own right. You know, his uh, his coat reminded me of the old glory days of the American Basketball Association, the ABA, <laughs> and the personalities that uh, played in that league before a few of them merged with the NBA. But I think most, I think it was Marvin Barnes most notably, <laughs> who said game time was on time and uh, <laughs> was was notorious for walking into the arena of the St. Louis Spirits, oftentimes wearing a, a mink coat with his basketball uniform underneath. Uh, you know, but Josiah Alec is a, is a kind of a throwback to that era of basketball personalities. And, and it, it's hard to say that he and Sam Griesel uh, are – sort of one and the same in, in what they brought to Nebraska basketball the last two years. Sam Griesel, you know, had gone to, you know, had gone to a different school for four years, had one more shot to play at his hometown school and, and was just all out hustle all the time. And he and Sam Hoiberg brought that to the floor. 
Now, he's a different player than Josiah Alec, much more of a score, maybe a little bit more polished, shall we say. Um, the elbow is not quite as pointed as they uh, might be when Josiah Alec is going for rebound. But like the, the all-out <clears throat> sell your soul for the place that is in your heart, Sam Greasel brought that to Nebraska last year, and I think that Nebraska was really going to miss that. But they found it in Josiah Alec. We, we, we've known his sister. She brings the same thing, a different personality perhaps than Nebraska volleyball has ever had. Um, and then her brother comes in, and I think I've said many times, as long as he's a 9-8, and 10-7 and seven guy, which he had a double-double the other night in the, uh, the win over Rutgers, he's just been everything I think that team could hope for in terms of a personality and all-out hustle. And he's not going to be the team MVP, but maybe the most valuable personality. Mm. It's just a, it's just the hometown flavor, um, you know, the passion that those kids from Lincoln or Waverly, in the case of Josiah, bring to bring to Nebraska basketball. And it's, you know, Hoiberg, you know, he didn't grow up in Lincoln, Sam, but he took to it quickly as a as a high school player, and and he certainly has that in his own way. You know, I think part of that's being the coach's kid and and having grown up around the sport the way that he did you see the way kevin McHale looked at him in the uh in the post game uh, in the in the locker room on sunday night uh we can talk about kevin McHale in a few minutes but but uh what those guys bring um you know i still go back to the conversation that i had early in in the hoiberg years um with a staff member about the importance of recruiting the home state and this was when Hunter Salas and Chucky Hepburn were, were coming up as, as prospects in, in Omaha. And, you know, the vibe that I got was it doesn't matter. Um, it's not important. They're talented guys, but there's other talented guys out there. If we miss on the home state kids, we'll go find somebody just as good or better, and, and we'll find more of them. And, and, you know, I'm here to tell you that it does matter. Uh, it, it matters for Nebraska football, and we're seeing why it matters for Nebraska basketball this year. When I think of that fur coat as he walked in and Seamus. Yeah, Seamus with utters the, uh, the dear God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what oh, is dear that? God. Oh, dear God. I mean, that was priceless. And I just think of Ric Flair, man. Saturday nights, TBS, <laughs> styling and profiling. Uh, and uh, and wearing, wearing the fur, man. And, and even Coach Switzer. Rocking his uh, his coyote and his beaver jacket, or I should say, uh, he was a quarterback. Jamel, Jamel, rocking the, the beaver coat. But hey, man, if you can pull it off, God love you. <laughs> Seventy cool. bucks on Amazon, man. That's right. Uh, I'll have to have to do a search afterwards and, and see if we can't show up uh, when Nebraska wins that first tournament game, all wearing. Oh, they're yeah. all going to wear fur coats, baby. <laughs> I'm saying we show up wearing the, the fur coats well, to celebrate a Nebraska victory. And it should it should be underscored here. That's 70 bucks on Amazon for a guy that's Josiah Alex size. Like, shout out Amazon. No free shout outs. But, like, that's a hell of a deal for, like, that's a, a big and tall type jacket. Like, 15, 15 <laughs> years ago, you have to custom make that fur coat. Now it's 70 bucks on Amazon. That's incredible. Some Wookiee gave their life for that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that fur coat. It, it all, know, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I was just going to say, in all seriousness, you look at it, where Nebraska's at, there's that double buy possibility. Take care of your job in Chrysler on Sunday. They should. We'll see. There's still a little apprehension, you know. <laughs> you it's, know? The road. it's the road. <laughs> no, I know. And you're right. You can raise both hands with that. And then you get into – who you get as at least you know you're going to have a buy, presumably. I think that's locked up, but yes. Iowa still might have something to say about where you finish. And they're hot. You, you look at Wisconsin's fade, Northwestern's hurt, Illinois has a tough finish, so does Sparty. So it's all positioned for Nebraska, but uh, we were kicking around just – that uh, that that double by who you'd want to face in in Indy if you're Nebraska. We're fast forwarding a bit past Michigan, but you know when we talk about matchups and how down is up and up is down, the Big Ten's been this year. You know, I think there's been some more favorable matchups than not, but it's a whole different deal when you get out of PBA. 
I, I don't think you want to face Rutgers again. And it's not so much that uh, they're, they're, they would be the most dangerous team as far as upset possibilities go. But, man, you come out of that game and you got to play again the next day. Yeah. I, I don't – I don't like the I don't like the odds for that team that gets by whoever gets knocked whoever knocks Rutgers out of the Big Ten tournament is uh, is going to be pretty bruised and and you saw those guys and the way they defend just get right up in your face the you know the even on the perimeter um, you know Kase and and Bryce Williams and um, Jamarcus Lawrence they were taken out of their game I mean Kase got loose toward the end and had about a one minute spurt where I think he scored 10 points and high fived half the crowd and, you know, had a four point play and everything, but that was really it for him. Um, so it's probably not Rutgers. I don't know. Um, couldn't they play Michigan again? That would that would play them two games in a row. That, that would be kind of nice well, to get them in, in Ann Arbor and somehow see them again in, in many. So as it stands right now, Nebraska is the four seed. Should they win? Against Michigan on Sunday, they'd likely retain that four spot. You might be able to jump Northwestern up to three, but let's play it as if Nebraska is the four seed. They'd be playing the winner of the five seed, who is currently Wisconsin, but Iowa's right there as well, so that's one to follow. Wisconsin, Iowa, you're two likely candidates. There's an outside shot. Minnesota could be the five seed as well, but as it stands, Wisconsin or Iowa, who would be playing the winner of the 12 and 13 matchup, which as it stands right now, is Rutgers and Maryland. So the winner of Rutgers, yeah. Maryland, should the season end today, would go on to take on Wisconsin. The winner of that game would then go on to play Nebraska. So those are your candidates as it stands right now. All that gets turned on its head. Should Nebraska move up to a three? Should Wisconsin and Iowa both stumble down the stretch and Minnesota moves up in there? And the bottom of the Big Ten's also got a little bit of parity between Rutgers, Maryland, and Penn State. Those are the three likely candidates to be in that spot, though. Well, well, I mean, if if it's if Rutgers can escape that that day one and play Iowa or Wisconsin and then lose, um, as I said, the team that would then go on to face Nebraska in the four or five game is going to be feeling kind of sore from the previous day while the Huskers are relaxing at the hotel pool. <laughs> All I know is uh, the next year can't get here fast enough, so we're going to have 18 teams to talk about uh, seeding for the turn. Uh, now. Um, Triple look, by. I, <laughs> I, yeah, you know, there, there are a lot of – there are a lot of teams I don't think Nebraska really wants to face. I'm not sure that, you know, a Wisconsin rematch, even though they've been down, you know, down the stretch, haven't played that well. I'm not sure Wisconsin's one Nebraska wants to play. Uh, Nebraska doesn't usually play very well against Iowa unless it's in PBA. Um, Minnesota is is a, you know, oh, a, a, is a hard, you know, hard mm-hmm. team to to kind of figure out. Uh, I think it's kind of odd. I almost, I'm thinking, you know, I, I wouldn't mind seeing Nebraska play Purdue again because I think if 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 mm-hmm. Mast can can pull Edie out and be a three point threat, and you take Edie away from the basket in some way, the way Nebraska and especially Tominaga uh, cut to the basket with with their motion offense, and and Edie's not there. And Mast is having a good game. Maybe they've got a better chance against Purdue than some of the other teams in the league. But on the other side of that, I'm not sure teams really want to play Nebraska right now. I mean, you see the way, you know, and Alex sets the tone with his physicality, diving on the floor for loose balls, Sam Hoiberg diving on the floor for loose balls, Juwan Gary with his rebounding ability. Yeah, maybe Tominaga it, it can be cold at times if you can take him out of his game. But there's a physicality that Nebraska brings that nobody else is playing with right now in the Big Ten. Well, and you're right. If Nebraska is going to play somebody on a on a back to back, somebody who's going to play a first or and a first or and a first and second round game, that's a lot of wear and tear just to get to that game against Nebraska, who's going to be fairly fresh and ready to you know you would think turn it on again like they did against Indiana, like they did against uh, Rutgers, you know. Um, We've seen it time and again, especially home games where Nebraska is just a lot more physical and has a lot more hustle than other teams in the conference. And, and Purdue has, I believe, if I remember correctly, locked up the one seed for the Big Ten tournament. So if Nebraska finishes as the four seed, they will be facing Purdue in the second round should they get past their first round game following the double bye. I'll, I'll tell you, Bill, I actually agree with you. I think Nebraska would love another shot at Purdue. Another team, though, I don't know whether I like the matchup or hate the matchup is Iowa. Iowa's come on strong. It's really like, it's funny that it's Iowa and Wisconsin being the two teams that Nebraska, as it stands right now, currently has the best shot of playing. 
because it's a tale of two different finishes to the season. Iowa's come on strong. Their offense has been fantastic. Their defense has come along. They've been playing really, really good basketball. As for Wisconsin, as it stands, as I forecast it, it looks like they're going to lose seven of their last 10 games to finish the regular season. They're in a downward trajectory. They've dropped all the way down to a six seed in the latest bracketology. They don't look great. And it's funny because, like, Iowa, as much as their hot start has, like, or their, their hot finish has scared me, if you will, I think Nebraska would love to get another shot at Iowa following what happened in Iowa City. Nobody's beaten Nebraska twice this year. I think this veteran Husker team would rise to that occasion. You flip it around to Wisconsin. Wisconsin's got extra motivation to go beat Nebraska after the lead they jumped out to in Lincoln, blowing it late, how that's kind of derailed their season. There's extra motivation for Wisconsin to get that back and show the tournament selection committee, no, that's not who we are. Who we are is this team that's going to go beat Nebraska in the Big Ten tournament. So it, it's, it's funny those two teams could be Nebraska's option just because of how their seasons have finished. One thing about you know, Iowa. Is funny. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. Well, that was just real quick. The one thing about Iowa, Nebraska beat Purdue and then had like a day in Lincoln and then traveled to Iowa City. And I think the weather was awful, as I recall, uh, in, in, in the troll travel. So the scheduling for Nebraska playing in, in Iowa City was not favorable. It was one of those stretches where Nebraska had a big game uh, and then a real quick turnaround. I think they played Tuesday, Friday or something like that. Yep. Very similar to when they what they beat Wisconsin, then had to go play Illinois Northwestern three games in six days. So that loss in Iowa was – you could throw the scheduling and the conditions as to be – you know, do uh, right for a letdown. Isn't it incredible as we come down the stretch for this, uh, for this 14 team big 10, that the basketball standings at the end of the regular season, the last week are Purdue, Illinois, Northwestern, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota. That's the West. I mean, the revenge of the big 10 West. I know we don't play big 10 West in, uh, in basketball West versus East, but the, the West is occupying one through seven, uh, with Michigan State right there tied with tied with the Gophers, but Minnesota has an edge in in overall record, so they look they look higher in the conference standings. Not sure if that holds true with the seedings, but very close. I, I mean, the Big Ten West you take it take it on the chin for for all these years in football, and here they are at the very end holding it up in in hoops, um, pulling their weight. Sure that means uh-huh. it, I don't think it means anything at all, but it's a basketball it conference. Mean, I think it means if you does... want to be good at football, you have to sacrifice basketball. If you want to be good at basketball, you have to sacrifice football. I think that's what it means. It means the schools that make the most money in football are terrible in basketball. Somehow, <laughs> at, least, at least this year anyway. Yeah, right. Right. Uh, the Ohio state, Michigan, they've, they've got a little history in, in, in basketball, but it's just not, it's not uh it's not there for them this year. The Buckeyes are, the Buckeyes are making it respectable, at least eight and eleven. Yeah, they're working on it, Mitch. Before we move uh, off of basketball, and Bill, I know you can chime in too. And Elijah and I were pretty excited to see the the footage released of Kevin McHale's post game uh, talk, and that's special for Fred. He detailed it in the post game for sure. Uh, but having Mc- McHale here and. That was pretty awesome, and I know you caught up with Fred just for a moment afterwards. I did. Oh, you know, yeah, I was talking to Fred about another subject you can read um, in The Athletic, um, you know, around the time this pod this pod uh, posts online about Gretna basketball. And, you know, I dove down into the high school ranks and wrote about the Dragons and their um, heartbreaking, incredible um, – Amazing season of of uh, losing their coach Brad Feekin in the in the middle of um, in the middle of the year, and Fred was Fred was there that night. Um, I was there, saw Fred, didn't talk to him on December thirtieth. It was the day that that Coach Feekin passed away, and and Gretna played in the holiday tournament. So, um, I, yeah, I spent a few moments with Fred after the game on Sunday, talking about being in that gym at Omaha Creighton Prep. So his thoughts are are a small part of. Um, of that piece. But, um, when you're hearing this, um, you can go find that, um, online, but, uh, Kevin McHale, um, abrupt change of, of subject. Um, yeah, that was a thrill, uh, to see Kevin McHale sitting courtside, uh, behind the basket, uh, alongside the governor of Nebraska, um, on, uh, on Sunday night. Are you referring to, are you referring to Jim Pillen or Jordan Larson? 
Well, um, <laughs> Governor Pillen was 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 seated there. Uh, Jordan Larson also has that status, I suppose, Elijah. But but uh, I didn't see Jordan um, at the game. She might have been there. If she was, I apologize. But um, yeah, that was a that was a thrill for me as a child of the '80s to see Kevin McHale and 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 then also to hear from from Fred Hoiberg after the game. And we know about the connection between Hoiberg and McHale and and why Kevin McHale was there. He was Fred Hoiberg's coach with the Timberwolves when when Fred had the had the the heart condition that caused him to to have to retire and then and then went into the front or front office in minnesota and and mikhail was the gm so they're pretty tight they play golf together they hang, they like to hang out and talk on the phone and and kevin mikhail visited with the nebraska basketball team in the locker room as you saw on um, on social media after the game sunday night but um, fred did enlighten us and and let us know that he is the only player to have played for both Kevin McHale and Larry Bird, um, McHale's old teammate with the Celtics. So, um, again, I, I, I personally enjoyed hearing about that. And, uh, I don't know if, uh, if, if everyone else who's, who's younger than me did, but it was fun to, fun to hear and, and fun to just stand there and watch Kevin McHale walk by. He is, uh, he is a, still a, a large man, um, at his, uh, mm-hmm. at his age. Well, I wish I'd known that he was going to be in town cause I hosted the Houston Rockets studio shows when he was the head coach of the Rockets for those uh, a couple of plus seasons. And I'm sure that if uh, we had seen each other, I would have gotten a very hearty. How's it going? Um, that's probably, <laughs> that might've that might been the extent of his memories of my, uh, my tenure with the two year tenure with the Rockets organization. But uh, I, you know, I, it, you're right. Bill, you're how very, are you? God, I still remember what you said. That. I still I remember what you said about my team after the OKC game. <laughs> uh, uh, and you were right what you said about James Harden. But anyway, uh, uh, it probably would have been a uh, hey, Bob. Um, anyway, um, Will, but, are you Will? <laughs> <laughs> you know he he is a he, he is um, he has a presence. And, and in, in part because, well, it, you know, just his, his physical stature being 6'10". And, but, you know, as, as somebody who grew up watching him play with, with those teams and, and having, to, having the opportunity that I did back in Houston to meet some of those the legends who built the game, they, they just have some air about them that you even at in the mid-50s, you're going, wow, that's, that's Kevin McHale or that's Larry Bird or that's Dr. J or – uh, so I, it was cool. For, it was cool for me to see him walk in and and just see that video. And then you, you know, hear somebody say, "Yeah, you know, Charles Barkley says he's the best player to ever play in the NBA," and you know, this generation wouldn't believe it. But it's hard to it's hard to not have him in that conversation. I just love eighties eighties basketball, Mitch, Bill. <laughs> I mean, it was awesome. Different game. Absolutely. Uh, that that you know, I fell in love with uh, with with the NBA. <clears throat> I fell out of love with the NBA at some point later, but um, <laughs> it broke I, up with me. Yeah, <laughs> but in the '80s, it absolutely did with the the Bird versus Magic and you know McHale and James Worthy and all of the other characters and supporting cast on those teams were were amazing to watch. And did you see did you see the move um, that that Fred pulled on the way off the court? Um, I, I give credit to uh, to Chase Madison. Um, from uh, um, Channel Three in Omaha, with the video of this on on Twitter the other night. But Fred's coming off the court with McHale and his his number one recruit in the state of Nebraska, Amari Bynum from Omaha. Brian is standing there, and and Nate Lenzer, being the the um, consummate assistant coach, is is waiting for Hoiberg as he comes toward the tunnel, and Fred's got. You know, he's been on TV. He's got people yelling at him. He's got McHale on one side. You know, he he maybe is not going to see Bynum, but Lenzer is there. Like as as Evan Cooper would be if Matt Rule was in that situation, or any other assistant coach who's earning their paycheck three times over that day. Um, and he says, "Coach," you know, he points to to Amari, and Hoiberg walks up and shakes his hand, and he says, "Meet Kevin McHale," and Kevin Kevin shakes hands with with uh, Amari Bynum and and I'm not sure if Amari Bynum I it was hard to tell from the reaction um, what he thought of Kevin McHale who 
was done playing before Amari was born. But I think his his mother, uh, Fred went on then to to hug Amari's mother and and uh, and then Mikhail said hello to her. So kind of nice to be a, a Big Ten coach and just have a an NBA Hall of Famer just trailing behind you like, oh yeah, I got I got Kevin McHale back here. Say hello. <laughs> here, here's Amari. Here's, Amari here's, went. You're the guy from Cheers. Right? <laughs> he was here, on here, Cheers. It here was a the, great cameo. Uh, the 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 most defining play maybe of the '80s for me NBA is, is Kurt Rambis getting fouled by Kevin McHale, and I think Cedric Maxwell might have been on that. But didn't Kevin McHale? Isn't he the one that closed line Kurt Rambis in the uh, playoffs, Lakers and Celtics? To me, that defines the NBA, the game that you would never see today. Right? Getting closed lined. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> or, 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 two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or, or how about Bird? Bird just like gets absolutely ripped down by Lambeer with Rodman around his feet. And then Bird just starts throwing punches like they're. Yeah, they're, they're they're playing for the uh, the Boston Bruins. It, it's, it's nuts. <laughs> it all it that's the NBA guys. I grew up with, and Kevin it McHale all- defined that with the foul on Rambus. And you guys act like that era is a bygone era. Like you don't watch Draymond Green kick dudes in the nuts on the daily playing for the Warriors. You have Jokic. Yeah, he, he that, knocked that, out here's one of the, the Morris brothers. Here's the deal. There's only you, one Draymond. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You can say, well, Draymond Green did it back then. Everybody did it, or every team had one or two of those guys, right? <laughs> Mark Ivoroni, for Pete's sakes, made with you know Joe Klein. They had yeah. six fouls and they earned them and they used well, them. It all comes full circle because Nebraska's got one of those guys, and we started this conversation <laughs> yeah. talking about Josiah Alec. Yeah, there you and, go. You know, his game reminds me a little bit of Dennis Rodman, who would yes. frequently wear a fur coat to an event like a post-game press conference. So maybe Josiah, um, without telling us, was given a little nod to uh, to Rod. The worm. To the yeah, worm. worm, yes. I Thank you. For, <laughs> Thank we, you for, we need the, colored the hair from Josiah. Like, we need him to get the Big Ten tournament logo in his hair by the time that Nebraska makes it out to Indianapolis. You know the one I'm talking about with all the different team colors in a circle? Mm-hmm. I think with his mm-hmm. hair, that could work really, really well, and it'd be a little uh, homage to Dennis Rodman. Sure, he'll uh, he'll do that. <laughs> it's the Average Joe Sports Show. That's Elijah Herbal, Bill Dolman, Mitch Sherman, Chris Schmidt. Find us on Spotify and iTunes and uh, watch the show on YouTube, the AJ Sports Show, the AJ Sports Pods, where you can find and follow on Twitter. Guys, uh, from basketball to a team that's off to their best start since 08, Husker Baseball, 7-3. and three. On the season and uh, top five, can we say Elijah uh, in, in RPI? But for for a, a brief two hour window, what a, a top spot in RPA RPI? Nonetheless, great comebacks uh, in uh, in Charleston uh, against the College of Charleston. You know what the RPI likes is when you don't play at home and you win. <laughs> the RPI loves loves those road games. Rutgers is also up there in the top 10 of the RPI and, and sad, very sadly for the big 10, those numbers, no matter what Nebraska and Rutgers do through the regular season are just going to sink a little bit lower and a little <laughs> bit lower and a little bit lower as they go through the season and, and things even out with the home versus away. But right now, Nebraska seven and three overall, they're six and one in true road games. And, and they just swept the college of Charleston and, and, you know, we sat here on our last episode and, and talked about the College of Charleston, which was undefeated coming into that weekend against Nebraska. Like uh, it would be a pretty formidable foe for the Huskers. I mean, these kids, they play in, in South Carolina and, and they've got an advantage of being able to be outside from the first day of, of spring practice and in, in sometime in January. But um, it was Nebraska that was poised and composed and won all three of those games in – it's final at bat, uh, the tenth inning on Thursday, and then Saturday, Sunday with ninth inning heroics, and that's tough to do as a road team. That's hard enough to do when you can walk off the victories, but when you've got to go out and score the runs and then hold the the, the home team down um, in the bottom of the inning to win, um, you know, Will Bolt and Rob Childress, um, it's early, 
but it's 10 games. So it's enough of a sample size to be able to say something about this team. They are, it, it appears, instilling something into this group that is, is, the, is, is like the kind of stuff that you need, um, like the intangibles, just the little X factor in, in, in a college baseball team that gets a program like Nebraska to have a special season. You know, LSU, they have great seasons because of Paul Skeens. And, and, you know, players who are pitching for the Yankees in September after being in the College World Series in June. Um, for Nebraska, it's the kind of stuff that we saw in, on, that, on that weekend in the ninth and tenth inning, in the eighth inning um, one night uh, against the College of Charleston. And I realize that the College of Charleston is not um, even like Iowa in the Big Ten or Indiana or Maryland or, or whoever the favorite is supposed to be this year, Rutgers, according to the RPI. Uh, but still, it's pretty nice to be able to do that in the first week of March. When I'm with you there, Mitch. One thing I'll say, and I'll keep it quick, because, Bill, I know you have a follow-up point to that, is that individually, on its face, going and sweeping the College of Charleston is not an overtly impressive feat for a major conference baseball team. But the way in which they did it, combined with the fact that you just went and swept Grand Canyon – which, again, by itself, sweeping Grand Canyon is not one of those things that I think it's not national newsworthy. It's not, oh, rank Husker baseball. But by going and sweeping Grand Canyon and then facing some adversity against the College Charles, I guess they didn't sweep Grand Canyon. They got three out of four, but you know what I'm saying. They got the three wins. Close enough. Uh, and then going and sweeping the College of Charleston, like it shows the medal of this team the way in which it happened, the fact that you're stacking good performances, it's not easy to go on the road. That's why the RPI loves Nebraska going on the road. It's tough to do whenever you're living out of a suitcase at this point in the season where you're going and playing a weekend series and you come back to Lincoln for a cup of coffee and then you're back on a flight and you're headed to Charleston, living out of that suitcase, living out of a hotel, all while trying to do your schoolwork. Individually, a one weekend against the College of Charleston, you know what? It happens in baseball. You get hot. The other team doesn't. You can get a three-game series victory against a team that's better than you. But the way in which Nebraska did it, by having some late rallies, finishing it off, after already having an impressive series the week before against Grand Canyon, they're not pushover teams. Nebraska's expected to beat these teams, but it's impressive the way in which they've been stacking these performances and seemingly getting better while doing it. Will Will Bolt and and, and Brett Sears and... Riley Silva and those guys, Josh Karen, can they go over and walk across the bridge to, to PBA before they leave, <laughs> before the basketball leaves town this weekend and just give them a little pep talk about playing on the road? <laughs> you know, because it's on the road the rest of the way for Nebraska basketball, which has been a little bit of a struggle this year. And, and you see, you know, that the RPI, the NET, whatever it does, how much they value road wins, mm-hmm. there's a reason for it because it's tough to do. Look, I, I, I don't dismiss, you know, that they were supposed to beat Grand Canyon – supposed to be in college of charleston those are those are teams that have been at it for a while they're down south they've got really good talent it's it's one of those deals where it it, it's it's a little bit like the the mid-major basketball schools that yeah they ain't got a a big football program but they can play basketball or in in down south they've got those kinds of baseball programs and grand canyon's got all kinds of money uh they've got great facilities and they've got players from around arizona and southern california i mean I, i think that's a you know, fairly formidable program that, you know, at some point is going to be in a regional and they're going to sneak into maybe, you know, be, they're going to be like the Citadel making the College World Series. Decent program that they 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 catch it and they're they're there. But I think that's a, a pretty good program. And they invest in basketball and baseball and women's volleyball. College of Charleston, look, they were unbeaten. And they were averaging like eight, nine runs a game. And they were playing at home. And I think what's also significant is, look, Nebraska's 7-3. and three. They dropped a couple of games they should have won in Houston at the beginning of the season. They should have left – or Arlington. They should have left there, you know, 3-0. and oh, But they, they lost two games late. And to come back after those disappointing loss, late-inning losses, and to win games late, several of them. Uh, now, what, Nebraska's like, what, four – Four wins this season in their last at-bat or last two Mm at-bats. So to come back from dropping those two in the season opening series and to rectify it and to figure it out and not let it happen again, 
I think there are a lot of positives uh, for that team and the personality develops out of that. And, and you said, well, and Bill, maybe the best way to, to put my earlier point, which kind of goes with what you said, is, is it does mean something. But, like, I went down to Oxford, Mississippi and watched the 2022 Ole Miss baseball team. I believe they got swept by LSU that weekend. Uh, I know I went to the Friday night game. I know they won't, they lost the first two. I believe they lost all three. It's a high score on Sunday. What I'm saying here, Ole Miss got run out of town by LSU that weekend on their home field, and later in the year they go on to win the national championship. So I, I guess the better way to put what I'm saying is just in baseball, things like that happen. It's when you start stacking performances week after week and getting better as the year goes on. Those are the kind of the telling signs of when you have a good baseball program. It's not going and getting a sweep over the course of a weekend or going and getting a series victory against a good team. That can tell you something, but it's about that consistency from week to week to continue stacking performances and say, we're not happy with Grand Canyon. It wasn't just a hot weekend for the bats. We're just a, a damn good baseball team that you know, if the bats aren't there, the pitchers will step up. If the pitching's not there, the, the bats will step up. That's what kind of performance you need to be able to stack weekend win after weekend win after weekend win and that's what we're starting to see with this Husker baseball team obviously and, you wait for the talent to step up a little bit but there are I guess uh the the level of competition to step up a little bit as you enter Big Ten play and it's truly great opponent after great opponent which maybe not in the Big Ten but you get what I'm saying relatively speaking relatively speaking I, I need to see a larger sample size but the past two weekends have been very very positive for Husker baseball and and, and really in general with Nebraska baseball things don't get going like the bats don't warm up they really don't start to hit their stride until they play at Haymarket Park and that comes this weekend. So there's a real opportunity over these next three weeks for this team to gain momentum on top of what's, what's already happened here at the start. You got South Alabama coming in and then a road trip to Wichita state next week, Nichols coming in after that. I mean, these are not, these these are programs that are, I think a, a little bit of a step down perhaps now South Alabama has a, has a good record. Um, but Nebraska playing them at home should be a more winnable situation than going on the road to Grand Canyon or College of Charleston. Uh, Nichols, and there's the game against Omaha. Then you got North Dakota State, New Mexico State for for three, and then Kansas State before they get into into Big Ten play. So Nebraska at seven and three has an opportunity to go through March as long as the weather holds out and enter Big Ten play with an RPI and a, and a, a resume that is, can, could put it in a position that's different than what the Huskers faced last year, where they just had to go and win the big 10 tournament. You know, there's a, there's a path at least for the Huskers to build a resume that allows them a little bit of wiggle room, you know, a little bit of, 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 of leniency in the big 10 so that they don't have to fight tooth and nail to get the number one seed and then win that conference tournament. And that would be real nice to see. Well, and it's not been Mitch commonplace for Nebraska to not have to stress towards the end of the year, to your point about having to go get to Omaha, win in Omaha or wherever the, the, the big 10 tournaments at. No, I mean, they realistically could enter in with less than double digit losses I mean, based on what you laid out for me, going into they Big could go Ten. go into play. April, yeah, well, into Big Ten play, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. For all, oh, they should. They should. I mean, going to Wichita is never an easy thing, but the rest of those games, I mean, you're, you're basically a favorite. Now, you're not going to sweep everybody you play, even at home, but they, uh, yeah, they, they've definitely got an opportunity, as I said, to be sitting way above 500, you know, with a, with a gaudy-looking record when they open league play against Northwestern at the end of March. Let me ask this. What do you think? And I know that it's been complimentary. What do you think the strength of this baseball team? Is it coaching? Is it, is it the, the hitting? Is it your, your, your pitching jump with coach Childress? I mean, what would you circle early on right now as the, all right, this, this is what you can lean on when it gets tough. I think it's pitching and, you know, the foundation of, of great teams is generally pitching um, you know, there are exceptions to that, but um, you know, it's the way baseball, I, I think, should be played is, is with a, a great pitch, a great deep pitching staff or, you know, a couple of horses at the top of the 
rotation, but the, the, the ERA is, is a full run down from what it was a year ago. And um, offensively, you know, this is not a team that's going to hit the home runs that it did last year. That, that that's evident from the first 10 games, but um, the work that Childress, you know, Bolt gets credit. It, it was, it's, it's his, his selection to go, go out and, and, and bring Rob to the, to the forefront. Um, but Rob is the guru when it comes to um, getting those guys to get up on the mound and pitch and, and, you know, they've been able to get out of jams. They've been able to go get a new arm from the pen when something's not working. Um, they got in trouble on Sunday in the in the ninth in the bottom of the ninth inning, and Charleston had a rally going, and, and they just went out and, and and got the next guy out of the bullpen, and 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 quickly the game was over. So uh, that's how you win. That's how you win over time. You're going to win some games with hitting fourteen to eleven, whatever. But over time in the Big Ten they're going to win if they pitch. And that to me so far in the games that I've seen looks to be the biggest difference between this team and and the one we saw a year ago. I think the offense is more balanced than it was last year or when when you had Matthews and Anderson, that, that lineup, you were trying to turn it over with men on base and get to the top and then try to set the the table for the, the two or three run homer. And mm-hmm. this year, I think it's turning turning the lineup over to manufacture runs. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think you've got some production in the lower third, and then you've got people know how to get on base. You know, at the top of the order. So I, I think that's that's positive. Uh, I, I think the bullpen has been unexpectedly really good, and th- it's deep. Um, which which and the way I look at that is Nebraska has to win midweek games. That that was the that was really the the most glaring inadequacy mm-hmm. last year was they they just were were terrible midweek because the pitching wasn't there. So if you have pitching depth, with you know five guys coming out of the pen or maybe even six, and one of those guys can give you a quality midweek start, so that you are beating Omaha or you're beating Creighton or whoever else is on your Tuesday Wednesday table, that that depth in the pen to find the midweek starter, I think is one of the most critical things for this team. I also think that they need, they need to have some more consistency. I think the ERAs with, with, uh, with the starters are a little high, but for the most part, if that bullpen develops somebody that can give you five innings on, on Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, that's a big deal. And so far that depth has been there uh, out of the bullpen. And I'll, I'm going to jump in here and, give you the cop-out answer on the strength of this team. The strength of the team is the fact that there isn't really any strength to the team. It's, it's how balanced this team is, is in that you can't have a, a team that's going to come in. I don't think a team that's got great pitching but subpar hitting is going to come in and beat Nebraska in a weekend series. And vice versa, I don't think a team with great hitting with subpar pitching is going to come in and beat this Husker baseball team. It's going to take a balanced attack and a balanced team to come in and beat the Husker baseball team this year because – if the bats aren't going for Nebraska because you're facing great pitching, the Husker pitching staff is good enough to, to come in and, and take care of hitters that, you know, are, are batting 240. They're batting 230. They haven't had all that success. You're not going to get one-way baseball programs that will be pitching or hitting that are going to come in and beat this Husker baseball team. It takes a balanced team. It takes It's going to take a top-to-bottom roster to come in and beat this Husker baseball team. And, and I speak in generalities here. I'm not saying in any one-off game. I'm seeing over the course of a weekend series because guys are going to have bad games. Guys from other teams are going to come in and have great performances against Nebraska. That's going to happen. That's baseball. But in order to beat this Husker baseball team in a three-game or a four-game weekend series, you are going to have to be balanced because of how balanced this Husker baseball team is and how many different ways they've already shown this year that they can beat you. Elijah Herbal, Bill Dolman, Mitch Sherman, Chris Schmidt, Hale, the Average Joe Sports Show, and the uh, Pod. Uh, I've seen, you, I've heard you on the Hale Varsity Radio Show. I, just, I know, you know, I know. Uh, I know it's not a four-letter word. I, I, I get it. I, but yeah. So moving forward. <laughs> oh no! Look at his face play... get all red. Look how embarrassed he is. <laughs> no, we're good. I, uh, I... <laughs> yeah. So we're talking baseball here on the Average Joe Sports Show podcast, <laughs> and find us on Spotify and iTunes, and make sure you follow and subscribe the Average Joe Sports Show on YouTube. Like and follow. And uh, the AJ Sports Pod on Twitter. Guys, we've hit some baseball. We've talked basketball. 
Let's dive into some football and still a little bit of time yet before spring ball gets going. But uh, Matt Rule did a did a pod today on a, on a national network, and it's uh, a lot of things were covered. Uh, the quarterback question when it comes to Riola, you know, how do you know if if a guy is ready? A rules response, you know, when you know who you have for that starting quarterback. He talked about Tony White. Then he talked a little bit about Nebraska getting past that mentality of being a victim of the past. And uh, that's something that's plagued Nebraska football for a while is close ball games, close losses in ball games. Last year, they're chasing three, right? I mean, you could have had eight, nine, ten. You ended up with five. Pretty uh, fascinating here with Nebraska to see where they go and how they approach it. Right now, it's the actions by the guys is what rules focused on. How are they doing the day-to-day when the cameras aren't on? And he said that before, but he kind of continues to reinforce that. It's a certain mentality, Mitch. Yeah, you talk about uh, not being a victim of the past. It's like uh, these guys are, are running from ghosts, and that's mm-hmm. that's the – you know, that's the story of Nebraska football in the last few years, at least the last maybe three since we settled into this pattern um, under Scott Frost of losing in every way imaginable by every possible combination of, of two and three point uh, margins. So Nebraska is still trying to get out from under that. You know, they they can spin it in whatever way they want. And and here we are, you know, putting it into a positive light, chasing three. Well, strip away all of the, you know, documentaries and, and, you know, everything that, that they've, the window dressing that they've put on what chasing three means. And, and what it comes down to is they're still not winning close games. So uh, it's, and, 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 you know, we talked about this earlier, earlier today, guys, it's, 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 it's these coaches, it's one year for them. And a lot of these players now in the program, it's one year or this is the start for them. But for the fans and the people whose attitudes shape the expectations around the program and for the players, and there are several of them who've been here now for a long time. You know, Matt Rule can talk about his fifth and sixth year seniors and all the good things that come with that, but they also have memories long memories of continually just getting kicked when they're down. And it's something that they're just going to have to continue to find ways to overcome. And I like the, the approach that they're taking right now about breaking it up and the offense can win, get one or two, one or two points better. The defense can get one or two points better, the special teams. Um, but until they go out and do it, Rule will be the first to tell you this. Tony White will tell you this. It's talk. And they can work hard. And they are working hard. They'll continue to. They'll take it up a notch on March 24th when spring practice begins. But um, they got to do it in August and September and October. And that's certainly the aim here in in 2024. I still think it should be chasing four. Not into the tie. But anyway. The problem with that is, are you going to get two safeties? Or or how are you going to get four? Why why stop at four? Just call it chasing 14. You can avoid playing in close games by blowing everybody out. If you're just up 21 in the fourth, you ain't got to worry about it. Just cover the number. Chasing the cover. All those games they lost by three points. You know, I I, I don't want to go to overtime and leave it to Kyle Shanahan. Um, So so let's chase four. Let's, Let's chase four. Yeah, just uh, just win it in regulation. But anyway, um, I think that this team is 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 benefiting from the Fred factor. There's not since signing day, for the most part, Nebraska football, relatively speaking, is under the radar. You know, uh, and that's a cliche, but um, they, you know, the Matt Rule uh, um, podcast kind of popped up. It was like. Oh, I forgot, or I didn't know that he was talking. And, you know, a year ago it was, you know, what are the results of every Matt drill and which which unit had gone to the most Nebraska tennis matches and who's best in, in conditioning and what do we know about Corey Campbell and what do we know about this coach and, and, and pork, you know, all, all these guys are, uh, what's what's the guy's pot roast or what's the guy's nickname? Yeah, yeah, pot, yeah. Pot, roast. yeah. pot roast, yeah. Yeah, so 
you know, we're getting all these coaches in, and it was from no, mid, late November up until spring ball, it was wall-to-wall Nebraska football. And even when Nebraska basketball made that nice run in, in February and, and uh, people were kind of excited about it, and, you know, you had Nebraska women's basketball and all that, it was still first and foremost Husker football. And it always will be. But for the most part, for the last month, it's just been uh, an off. It's actually been somewhat of an off season in terms of the headlines for Husker football, and and maybe by operating that way, maybe um, Matt Rule and company can get things done and focus a little bit more than last year when they were going around and trying to meet everybody and, and get to know everybody on the team too. It does have to be a little bit refreshing, just kind of a nice feeling to not be the only. Uh, team in the spotlight when when it's the middle of your off season. You know, Rule was a Rule's generally a, a pretty prominent figure when he's at Pinnacle Bank Arena. But Sunday they showed him once on the Husker Vision screens at the very end. He was just throwing the bones up in his suite with um, Vivian and Leona, his two daughters. Looked like they were having a good time, and I actually felt kind of happy for 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 Matt Rule because it was like one time when he was at a at a at an event and he wasn't the the main. Uh, focus of attention like he deserves to get that like once in a calendar year <laughs> gotta right. feel bad for his poor daughters though it's the rush of a lifetime as a kid to be featured on the big screen like that well, they that, still got it okay I, i'm just saying like if i'm a kid i want to be on the big screen as much as possible like dad's famous awesome get me on the big screen it should be noted <laughs> for my time working at husker vision we had to work some awful awful husker basketball years during that time and it was always like all right husker basketball is down 20 10 minutes left to go in this one who's in the stands we need some crowd shots for this commercial break and here i'm on my camera just looking around and it was always all right there's nobody excited just go find some kids because kids are always pumped to be on the big screen so that was just my my quickest look the big the biggest news with nebraska football the last couple of weeks are matt rule's favorite restaurants in omaha and lincoln (laughs) you know we're not really talking about Rayola much. We talked about Chase and three. They they've kind of protected, you know, Dylan Rayola. I think for the oh, most yeah, part, absolutely. and Carter mm-hmm. Nelson, uh, letting him get acclimated to college, and whoever else is on the, you know, was in the recruiting class. Nash Hutmakers maybe been the biggest off season story. Uh, they certainly featured Ty Robinson in Chasing Three, and and justifiably so. Uh, and the dunk contest. Don't forget about the dunk contest. The dunk contest, you know, that was kind of a a lighthearted thing, but that was a sideshow to Nebraska basketball at home. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't have the dunk contest to get people in the seats so Elijah's camera could find him. That was just something extra to do. So I I think that there's there's a real positive, you know, that they they can just kind of operate business as usual without having to have open houses every day to get, you know, let people know what's going on and who they are. Do you ever have any NBA legends at PBA during your Husker Vision career that you could focus the camera lens on? Not that I can remember. We had some. Did Ty Lue ever show up? No, no. Um, Coaching legend. Anything noteworthy? We had those quick change people that come around. You know, the the halftime performance. This is the most notable experience I had during my time at Husker Vision working. Red Panda. Red Panda was cool, but the quick change was cooler. Because I'm back in like the production studio. It's kind of by the media room uh, back under PBA for the folks here in the podcast that have been to the media room at P- Pinnacle Bank Arena. We have our little control room right over, and I'm running the uh, the replays for all the in-house robo cams uh, for the game where the quick change artists are. And if you notice, if you look at the scoreboard at Pinnacle Bank Arena, there's about three or four cameras underneath the scoreboard. And we couldn't show it on the big screen, but you could train your cameras just down and get the secrets of the quick change artists while they're in that little curtain, and I can't share them. I didn't sign a non-disclosure agreement, but I'm not an asshole, so I'm not going to do so. I'm not going to ruin the performance. <laughs> but I have the video saved in my phone of how these quick change artists are doing it, and it's really cool. So that's yeah. that's about the coolest thing I got during Husker Vision. No Kevin McHale, no nothing. No Mikey no, Moore. No. Do you guys know the uh, this one quadrant of the scoreboard um, facing the uh, the benches, the big scoreboard over the over the – court one one whole quadrant of it went kept going out on uh on sunday yeah if you're chris where you were sitting on on the media area you couldn't see it but from on the opposite side of the arena all the fans were 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 getting treated to uh a black screen on (laughs) on a big portion of the scoreboard i thought that like karma was was setting in and nebraska was going to blow a 20 point lead or 15 point (laughs) lead because the scoreboard failed and 
so then after the game, I came out on the on the court to leave, um, and they had lowered the scoreboard. So it was the first the first time I've seen that where the scoreboard was actually sitting like about eight feet above the court. Um, hmm. Very people were taking pictures with it, like selfies with the scoreboard. Um, so I assume they're going to slide out that panel or they slid out that panel and, and replaced it. So it's good to go for, uh, for boy state basketball on, on Wednesday. But, um, I was amazed wow. by that, by that little nugget. I can't imagine how brutal it was to be on one of the Husker vision headsets as that was happening. I am sure that was just a hell of a time for all the student employees and the full timers who are working that because it's, it's all spread out. The main broadcast is actually run from Memorial stadium. They are on fiber optics underground between PBA and Memorial for the big screens at Pinnacle Bank Arena. So I'm sure you have some full-timer back at Memorial Stadium who's freaking out. All the student interns at Pinnacle <laughs> Bank Arena are running around trying to figure out what the hell's going on. I, I feel bad for those poor kids that had to deal with that. This is the kind of insight that you just can't get anywhere else. You know, but, I, okay. Love it. So Cyber bring, optics, secret tunnels. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. So we bring it back full circle. And people with Kevin McHale in the seats at Pinnacle Bank Arena bringing back old-school basketball when people at the game – only had basketball to watch, right? right? right. No right. big screens, no pyrotechnics, no halftime shows, whatever. Just good old-fashioned basketball the 1980s way with Kevin McHale on a blank screen at PBA. Well, bring your 80s to Chrysler Arena Sunday if you're Nebraska basketball. A little toughness, a little scoring, and get that 20-second uh, win. That'll wrap us up for the Average Joe Sports Show, episode 33. Again, Spotify and iTunes, and follow us uh, on Twitter at the AJ Sports Pod, and uh, subscribe and like on YouTube, the AJ Sports Show. Bill Dolman, Mitch Sherman, Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt. Talk to you next time.